No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome everyone to the Life Hack podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have an active da'i imam uh, and uh, all-round teacher uh, in the uh, coming to us from the United States. Uh, very active, uh, obviously, in his location of Minneapolis. And uh, I've seen a lot of his uh, messaging and posts on social media, and uh, we've uh, definitely benefited from those. And we'd like to welcome to the podcast, Imam Yusuf Susi. Welcome, Imam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair for your kind introduction. And uh, may Allah reward you all for, for doing what you're doing. And, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it uh, grow. And inshallah ta'ala find it on, on the day of judgment. Allahumma. Jazakumullah uh, khairan, ameen. Imam, I really appreciate the time you're taking out today. Uh, Imam's really busy and has uh, obviously a packed schedule. Taking time for us today, uh, we're really honored and uh, thankful for that. Uh, Imam, I just want to get right into things uh, so we can try to extract as uh, much uh, benefit from this conversation as possible. Let's start off right off the bat with, uh, we we're actually just had a brief conversation Previously, we were talking about how in Canada, we get a lot of our cultural cues from the United States just because of how massive uh, United States is and the massive media conglomerate that it wields. Now, um, we've seen in recent times a lot more Muslim characters, quote unquote, coming into pop culture. So previously, when you had Muslim characters, primarily the Muslim character would look like uh, either myself or the imam. And usually it would be in a role where we are threatening somebody. Uh, we are trying to blow something up. We're trying to hold somebody hostage. Um, or we're, uh, it would be like legions of us. And then we're just getting gunned down as we're trying to attack uh, innocent troops that are just trying to carry out their mission. So <laughs> we, this is usually how the, this type of character was uh, portrayed. Now we have other characters coming out, like uh, in recent uh, posts I've seen people commenting on Miss Marvel. Disney's coming out with Muslim characters, quote unquote. Netflix is coming out with Muslim characters, and they're trying to portray them in a more, um, from their perspective, a positive light. And uh, we, there was a show in Canada, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this uh, imam, it was called Little House on the Prairie, and so uh, it was, or sorry, Little Mosque on the Prairie, they took it from Little House on the Prairie, so as you can see, the name itself is very original, uh, so they took it from Little yeah. House on the Prairie, <laughs> and they call it Little Mosque on the Prairie, and um, it was, uh, it, I would say, in a similar vein of how Muslims uh, in some of these newer shows are being portrayed. So anyhow, um, some people are saying it's a positive thing. Some people are still critical of it. What do you say, Imam? Is it, uh, are we headed towards a good direction with some of these new Muslim characters that are being portrayed uh, on the screen? Wow, I'm, I don't know where to start. That, that was a lot. Um, however, I will try to do my best. Uh, for, for one, yeah. I would like to say I personally miss the wholesome family show called Little House on the Prairie. I used to watch it growing up. Okay. And, um, but I didn't, and, and I didn't think, I never thought much of it until living now and you think of just how the drastic, dramatic change has shifted from wholesome family shows like Little House on the Prairie to what we have today where you, you're, you're confused. You don't know what a man's role is, what a woman's role is, how a woman should address her husband, how a man should lead the family, how kids ought to address adults. I mean, all of that you could easily learn uh, by watching a, a show called Little House on the Prairie, right? Um, so I, subhanAllah, I, I miss those days. That was, that was a time when you can really turn on the television and kind of get your family around the TV and say, hey, we're going to watch something wholesome here just to pass some family time. I'm not sure a family, a Muslim, God-conscientious 
Muslim family, a husband, a mother who understands the concept of lower in the cave, of understanding these subliminal messages left, right, and center, bombarding their kids constantly. I, I don't want to sound cynical here or sound as though I'm saying everything is haram, but it, it, what is on TV today, I have a hard time sitting with me and my family, my very own, and saying, hey, you know what, this is permissible, which is not to say that Imam Yusuf is saying television in itself is muharram. This is not what I'm getting at. But and this is was not intended, by the way, but you mentioned Little House on the Prairie and then Little Mosque on the Prairie. But like you said, yeah, how original, unfortunately. It always seems like we're always kind of adding something and giving it a, an Islamic twist. You know, oh, it's a halal girlfriend. You know, flirt with her and say, mashallah, it becomes all Islamic now, right? Um, and I think, yeah. which leads to my second point is, Dr., uh, if you were to ask me, the ulama in the past, when they talked about why people didn't accept Islam, they would call it a sarif min as-sawarif. A sarif is a preventer, something that prevents someone from accepting Islam. So they would talk about Caesar, for example, mulkuhu wa kursiyuhu. They would say that the reason why he didn't accept his uh, accept Islam is because of his position and because of the chair, the kingdom that he had. That's one thing that prevented him from uh, accepting and submitting to uh, Islam. Another person, and might be pride and ego. Another person might be uh, money, right? It might be a lofty position in a company. So everybody's different. I feel what's holding us back the most as Muslims is the self-defeatist attitude coupled with a huge self-inferiority complex. Now you could say those are literally one and the same, right? I don't see a, a huge distinction. So what is happening today is that when you know and, and I'll, let me be very honest with you i have yet to watch the show miss marvel i commented on it because i saw some notes and comments uh and posts that were generated by other uh scholars that is and imams and just by looking at the surface of the color this is not something i want my children to be exposed to she uh for whatever reason when i see this concept of empowerment the majority of the time it's going to, you're going to lay your eyes on a woman who's breaking the very basic commands of Islam. For whatever reason, there's a common, <laughs> common thread. If someone's breaking barriers, they're usually breaking the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is at least from my just casual, casual observation. Not that I'm nitpicking and reading these articles day in and day out and pointing these things out. This is something that you could just see from the surface of it. The, the idea is, is that this girl, you have a Muslim girl from a very, very strict family, and she's not able to do what her colleagues and friends are doing. So there's this there's this issue between the parents, the girl, the parents, the typical Indo-Pakistani from back home. They're not willing to get with the dominant culture. They're not willing to kind of give in. They're just strict, you know, and they're from back home. They're from, we have to be done with those back in the day. And you have someone who wants to be liberated and she wants to do it on her own. And, and this is, no, this is not a positive message that we should be sending. We, we want Muslim women to display how proud they are of their religion, how proud they are of their hijab, how proud they are when they say, I don't have boyfriends, I don't have girlfriends, this in Islam is not something permissible because of A, B, C, X, Y, Z, not the, yeah, I can't, my mom and dad don't allow me to have a boyfriend. I know what a horrible life I'm living. This is kind of the attitude that's out there, right? But Muslims don't realize, wallahi by Allah, by he who created the heavens and the earth, we Muslims do not know how good we have it by sticking to these limitations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out for us. It's usually not until 20, 30 years when someone is in their 30s or 40s where they ponder and say, ha, huh, now I understand why mama didn't want me going late at night. Why Baba told me I want you to be home by Maghrib. Why daddy told me this. Why mama told me that. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, doctor, sometimes it's a little bit too late. Mm. Do you feel shows like this are a reflection of how society is right now? Or do you feel shows like this attempt to actually shape society or only amplify certain elements of society? I, I believe that what's happening right now here, we have to acknowledge that the one last religion on the face of the earth that's still standing authentically 
that's not willing to give in to the whims and desires and the everyday changes uh, that we see, I think hands down, bar none, we all we all can see it. It's the religion of Islam. They they worked on Judaism, they worked on Christianity, and they succeeded. So what's left right now for them to dismantle and tear down is the religion of Islam. And they're trying to do it. See, the, the scariest thing, doctor, is that they're not coming to tell you, hey, I want to destroy your religion. I want to destroy your iman because you would be taken back and you would oppose that kind of energy. But they come, they come and they're cloaked and the exterior of it looks inviting, it looks welcoming, and it looks nice. So you don't view this energy as being hostile. You're not taken back. You're not putting up your guards. You're just looking at it and saying, wow, they they like me. They're looking out for my best interest. And then it displays your mom and dad as these horrible enemies, you know, that just want to lock you down and keep you chained inside. So what's happening today is that they want Muslims to get with the dominant popular culture and the way they can easily subliminally slash implicitly do it and successfully do it is through media, through television, through shows, through soap operas, through Netflix, and the list goes on and on. Now, now <clears throat> I have my, my feeling in regards to this is that the way they uh, present it, it's almost like a Jedi mind trick. They tell people, hey, listen, uh, you're going, you, you need to rebel against being controlled. You got to be your own person. This is how you're going to be truly free and all these different types of messaging that goes along with that. So this is how you're going to rebel because there's a natural instinct some, you know, for teenage years to rebel against maybe something that they've grown up with. But what I find ironic is actually that's actually performing. That's actually uh, promoting conformity. You're actually telling people to conform to the dominant culture within society. So actually, you're, you're uh, propagandizing more conformity. A true, I would say, rebellion would be to reject the dominant culture, reject you know this zeitgeist of disrespecting parents or uh, immodesty and all of these different um, values that are associated with that and to say, no, I'm going to be co cool and calm and confident in my own practice of my religion and what I do. And in most times it's going to be an opposition, direct opposition and what you will see in movies and television on social media. Guess what? It's going to be way different and it's going to be a rebellion against that. So in my like, if when, when you look at it objectively, true rebellion true independence like ensure you're an independent minded person is not to follow the dominant culture you know yes. uh but they do a jedi yes. mind trick to say hey listen you're going to be an independent uh person free person you're going to show your critical thinking when you reject your own just in a very narrow uh, criteria, you reject just your own values and your own cultural norms and things like that. So it's it's interesting how these things are portrayed. Um, yeah, go ahead, Imam. See, it's yeah. it's almost. I don't want to say impossible. I would. I'm going to be very. Uh, I'm going to be very selective here with my word. And it is almost impossible, right, to defend yourself when the very person you're looking at is admired instead of criticized. You feel deep inside like they are better than me. So you're always, if you have that mentality, and of course this goes back to the self-inferiority complex, right? Like, hey, they're better. They're far advanced. They have things figured out, not like back home where they have this and we have that and so on and so forth. So I think that is a huge, huge dilemma is that when you're looking at the one in front of you uh, with admiration instead of looking at them with criticism. Mm. Uh, do you think part of that is uh, that what they call the immigrant mentality? When you come as an immigrant, you, you're coming in almost in a subjugated form, you know, to these Western countries. Do you feel that plays a big factor? May May I say May I say this, and I, and I hope I'm not misunderstood here. What is happening is sometimes it's it's easy to blame the children. But can we be honest and say that sometimes the blame is actually on the parents because the immigrant families, and of course, this has a lot of factors that we can't necessarily delve into now as to why that is, but the parents will come from back home 
and they're looking at their fellow co-workers and they're looking at their the people their colleagues and friends and looking at them with admiration and kids feed off of it this doesn't go i mean this is years and years and years of work at play here kids feed off of that energy you have some muslim parents they literally want to adopt the whole way of the popular culture while at the same time saying, hey, we have to do namaz, hey, we have to go to the masjid every once in a while, and you know, we want to praise and sing hymns about Allah and His Messenger, وسلم, but deep inside, the look that they have for the non-Muslims or for the West, or call it whatever you want, is the look of admiration. So unfortunately, kids feed off of that self-inferiority complex. And look, I, I'm not to say that I don't understand I can understand when you come from back home, you're living in a shack, you, you don't have shoes. You, I mean, my father's from Tunisia, so I grew up somewhat seeing this firsthand of people not having shoes. People go into, um, people go, go into schools and they're covering their heads with plastic bags. I, mm. I grew up seeing this. Um, even though this was years ago, but I grew up seeing that and you just look. So it's, I don't want to say it's understandable, but I don't want to say that it's not understandable. It's really tricky. You, you can see how someone will develop that self inferiority complex. And of course, it doesn't help when there's, there's no religion as the backbone or as the foundation. All you see are these movies and cartoons and th this development of technology and more technology and you're looking at those around you and your surroundings and you're saying wow we're we're living in the stone age you see so i i i, mm -hmm. I hope that somewhat helps maybe Yes, no, uh, definitely. Uh, that I, I believe that plays a, a massive factor that, that when people did come here, they came in uh, in a state uh, most times of need. There was a reason why um, they had to leave their homelands, you know, to come, you know, some, many times across the world to somewhat seek refuge from the conditions that they were in. And then if you sandwich on top of that, some of the messaging that people within the society would say to them, oh, you should be grateful for the opportunity. You came here, we gave you a chance, things like that. And that's why I think it's even more uh, uh, imperative for us to have a proper aqidah, to, to uh, understand the reality of our existence. You know, I've said to people before who, who say this type of attitude, well, we should be so grateful uh, you know, that they gave us the opportunity to, to come here. I said, you know what? I am not at all embarrassed or self-conscious uh, of how my my f father came to this country because he came in a way of, he came in a legal way. He came in a way that he had to show he's going to contribute to this society. None of my forefathers came to this country with the mission to subjugate people and to enslave people and to kill people and to take over people's lands. So I'm not embarrassed of how my forefather came here. My forefather came uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the acknowledgement or the agreement that he would contribute to the society, right? And like the whole time, like not a, a spot on the criminal record, uh, you know, just com completely contributing to the fabric and the structure of like, you know, this, the, this society. Whereas you can't, not people who can say, the people who say, oh, nativists who say that, oh, this is, you know, my country. How did your forefathers, you know, c c come to them? For many of them, it could have been as conquerors, right? Who did a lot of you know, harm to the people that already existed within this. And then I think the second thing, the most important thing, uh, and if you can, if I can get your comment on this, because I've seen, um, you know, a post where you talk about like, uh, you know, the five butts that are hurting Muslims, this might actually segue into that, is that if we believe in Allah, we believe and we understand history because, you know, Allah SWT tells us in the Quran to travel through the land and uh, to reflect you know, on the, uh, you know, that what happened to these people, right? As a reflection, the punishment of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and so forth. And we, if we know our history and we know how empires have risen and fall. But for us as a Muslim, you know, in the, the land belongs to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. 
And human beings have give, been given trustee over periods and portions of land during certain time periods. And so at the end, ultimately, we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's their first gratitude is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah allowed us to go from maybe a condition of uh, poverty to a condition of having. So uh, that is, I think, the, the most important thing that might get lost because you're looking at, okay, this person gave me this. No, this person was a means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something. Uh, can you comment perhaps on that, uh, Iman? Because maybe we distort our priorities or what we give uh, importance to. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. Um, mm. I am finding out slowly but surely that there's, there's this strong push out there to always look at things through a false dichotomy. But people are not mm. finding out or understanding how it, it, it is a false dichotomy. You can be appreciative of what someone has done for you, but disagree with them on a lot of fundamental things. People think that appreciation necessitates or requires me agreeing with you on everything. No. So there's this false dichotomy of, hey, appreciating and being a good uh, contributor to society means that you're going to go along with everything that is prevalent in popular culture. Right now, if you disagree with anything that's popular or trendy, then you're being unappreciative and you're not a good quote unquote contributor to the society. But I've seen this time and time again. And if you want, maybe we can have a different discussion on uh, 10 false dichotomies that I've come across just talking with Muslims, reading comments online. It's either they say it's either this or that. It's like, no, there's there's a third mm. option. Trust me, Wallahi, there's a third option, really. Right. So going back to that is. We have, see, our religion, doctor, our religion teaches us to be appreciative of what others have done for us, whether it be by Muslims, by non-Muslims, by who, by animals, right? I mean, our religion, we have no problem saying to the person who gave us the visa or for the person who let us entry or the, for the employer that, that you know, I'm not going to come to them and say, hey, by the way, I'm a, an unapologetic Muslim. I want to let you know that. You're not doing me a favor, okay? But I want to, no one is saying that we ought to do that. But at the same time, as you mentioned earlier, the bedrock, the foundation of everything, of our moving left and right, has to be a sound aqidah and for us to have pride in our religion, meaning that the priority of my life is maintained in my faith and my iman. Everything else is secondary, right? So we have no problem being appreciative. We have no problem thinking the governor, we have no problem thinking the people, but at the same time, we should not go to the other extreme to where we feel as though, well, the way of showing thanks is partaking in everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns. This is not the way to go about it, not at all. What I hear you're saying is that we should be grateful or appreciative of what people have done for us, but that yes. uh, gratitude does not necessitate subjugation. It doesn't necessitate you yes. subjugating yourself, your 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 principles to that particular person. Me, meaning, if if I may add, uh, it doesn't mean now that you have to look at yourself as a second class individual. It doesn't mean that now you have to look at them as though they're better than you because they gave you the visa because they gave you. You feel gratitude and you do your best as a Muslim to show them that you are grateful. But there are a wide array of means and ways of showing people how grateful you are without compromising the basic fundamentals of your religion. Meaning that if there's, for ex even though we're now, I feel like we're delving a little bit into the conversation, this is where it gets a little bit spicy. Mm. So for example, yeah. hey, you guys have a Christmas party? I wish you all the best. I'm not able to make it. If you're asked why, you can go into the reasons and the details, right? But you don't go there and you say, well, hey, they gave me a job. And they see, this is where the self inferiority complex starts to manifest itself, thinking that I just want to show them that I'm no different than them. See, that in itself is a huge problem in America and Dawah in America today. We want to prove to the non Muslim that, hey, there's really no difference between you and us. And I think this is very, very mm. problematic, it, very problematic. It's funny how you mentioned the, the Christmas party example, because I find that I have never seen 
a non-Muslim be offended that you cannot attend a Christmas party. But I have seen other Muslims comment and become offended on behalf of of non-Muslims if you don't attend a Christmas party. And I just find that bizarre because I've never had any blowback. I've been born and raised here. I've, you know, you don't partake in, you know, any of their different parties and things like that. And they're totally cool with it. But it's the, your fellow Muslim is like, oh, they're going to be offended. How do you, like, how could you do that? You know what I mean? It's, it's subhanAllah, so bizarre. And I think it goes to your inferiority complex comment. No, no, that, that is, I'm convinced, I am convinced 100% that it is an inferiority complex. And as you said earlier, the bulk of the heat that you're going to get nowadays, it's not from non-Muslims. A non-Muslim is not going to hold you at gunpoint at your job and say, you better make it to this Christmas party. And if you don't, you know what's awaiting you. They don't do this. But it's the Muslim who's going to wait for you on social media and tell you how this is not how you do dawah in America and this is not how you do PR. And everybody becomes an ex expert on how to do dawah and what's permissible, what's not, what's maslaha, what's mafsada, what's barura, what's not barura. And you just, wallahi, it's, it's very, very disheartening to see this happen. Yes. I feel the, the biggest opponent of the confident Muslim is the cowardly Muslim. I feel more than any non-Muslim. I feel the greatest criticizer of the confident Muslim is the cowardly Muslim. You know, subhanAllah, I feel that generally society appreciates people who um, are confident in what they believe in and are authentic. I, I believe it shows that you are not authentic in your yes. belief uh, when you practice sometimes and you don't practice sometimes. Or you try to always uh, appease people. People perceive that and they lo look at that and they don't really respect that. It's weak. I agree with you. Uh, so, Imam, how do we, because you are you were, um, you grew up uh, in the United States, right? Like your early years, um, you were exposed to the culture. Yeah, I grew up, I grew up back and forth. I uh, went to school in Tunis a few years went to school here. So I, I saw it on and I saw it all in elementary school. I saw it all in junior high and I saw it all in high school. And I continue continue to see just the rabbit the, the, the habit that it continues to have. Um, so no, it, it you see it all. Yes. I it's back and forth. It's back and forth. Um, so what would you say, you know, we talked about how Muslim characters are being portrayed and they're only being portrayed in a certain light, which is being promoted. And then young people growing up might idealize that or take their cues of how they should operate within society by watching, you know, things like that. Uh, we see this uh, culture of trying to just uh, essentially uh, strip ourselves of our core principles. So for the, for the average young person growing up, how are we, um, going to preserve that identity how are we going to counteract this pressure and these forces that are being placed from all different types of directions wallahi i can't i cannot say i cannot say that there's a one one fix you know that's going to fix everything um my when i think of the younger generation I wrote a post, it was a while back, that talked about you could probably text 200 posts per minute. You can log into all your social media platforms with your eyes closed. But the, 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 their, their stubbornness and the, coupled with ignorance, is it's a recipe for disaster. It really is. The younger generation, they've been propped up from a younger age to really think that it's all about them, that they're amazing and that they're great. And so when criticism comes their way, they do not know how to deal with criticism, right? It's all they've been taught is, no, you're doing a great job. All you guys have done great. No, you're amazing the way you are. I mean, look, there's a time for that. But if we really want people to get a little bit better, there has to be a little bit of criticism in the mix. When you see someone that's very, un we're not talking about how to do it. We're just saying that it has to be done. Right. Uh, and that is that when we see someone, for example, obese and very, you cannot keep telling that person that they look great. You are damaging them mm -hmm. and you're helping in their damage. When you see someone who's 
who's up for so many disease, so many autoimmune disease, so many disorders that are literally lurking and awaiting for, you know, awaiting for them just around the corner. I can't just say, well, we have to be loving and caring and just remind them of how great they are. No, they're, they're great the way they are. This is not the way of Islam. This is not what Islam teaches. But it also doesn't teach because some people are saying, well, what do you want me to just to go to them and say, hey, you fat people? No, I am also not saying that that's what we ought to do. Look, complimenting people with criticism has to be the norm. They go in tandem, they go together. When we're constantly complimenting someone, that's going to ruin them. When we're constantly criticizing someone, that's also going to ruin them. And that's why there's a balance in the Quran, um, which we might talk about that in a few minutes here, is just having the balance without secluding one over the other. But I would say to the younger generation is, they have to learn humility and they have to accept that what they know about the world is very, 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 very minute and little in comparison with what they don't know about the world, whether it's religious or non-religious. It's to have that humility and understand that, you know, maybe the those who went before me know a little bit better. Yes, they're traditional. They came from back home. Yes, my mom has a strong accent. Yes, my father can barely speak good English, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the younger generation has to learn humility. They have to learn that it's not all about them. That sometimes it's not that they're special. This idea, I think, it, it creates this false illusion. And so when the younger generation sees something that contradicts that false illusion, they're taken back. Oh, you're judgmental. You're being, you're not using compassion. You're not being loving. You're not being caring. You're pushing people away from the message. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, mm. You know, uh, I believe that attitude has uh, caused our standards to become lower and lower. It's like a race to the bottom in, in some respects. In our, because you mentioned this, you know, in the masjid, like, oh, let's show compassion. I've seen uh, youth, for example, behave without any manners and, you know, not in a proper etiquette in the masjid, like more and more so, you know, over the past, you know, two decades, I've just seen this decline of how uh, just the young generation operate and behave and interact with the masajid, the imams, the, 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 the people of knowledge, our, our elderly. And when you bring this up with other people, with uh, maybe senior administration, the uh, answer is always, at least they're coming to the masjid. Like, like, as if this is like a very enlightened uh, answer. And that's in, in, in and of itself, yes, it's better for them to be in the masjid than, you know, maybe to be just hanging out in the mall, in the clubs or whatever, or at home, like in a dark room, you know, on a screen. Okay, that in and of itself, maybe there's a, a point to it, but do we just stop there? You know what I mean? Like, it's like almost like a, a race to the one. At least they come to the masjid. Oh, they're they're eating. During, I've seen this, by the way, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Somebody eating during the khutbah at Jum'ah. It's like, oh, at least he's eating. At the mush, you know what I mean? He's eating. And oh, wow. I, it's like, wow. What an amazing, what a yeah, virtuous and crumbs deed. are falling. Wow. You, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? At least he's eating his right hand, <laughs> you know, in the mush. No, so, like, like doctor, it's like our, 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 it's like these sliding standards. Like, at least he's in the mush. It's like, no, is that like our standards? Like, at least he's in the mush. Uh, how, like so now this thing of like we're all like you know we're all miss marvel we're all these heroes how do we turn that corner because that's not reality how do we make real men and women how do we make real heroes how can like our senior like our massage and our parents uh help pave the way for that well Lahi, i feel like this is a, a separate discussion on it on its own the whole you're scaring people away from because i've written extensively about it on posts and i i've um, i'm very critical yeah. of this approach i here's what it there's a huge problem when you give the impression to the average muslim or average muslim that they're actually doing allah and his religion a favor i find that to be the root of all evil if you were to ask me why because it's not that. You're doing no one a favor. It doesn't change Allah. It doesn't change his religion. You're doing yourself a favor 
by practicing Islam, by coming to the masjid, by wearing hijab, by being obedient to your parents, by praying five times a day, you're doing yourself a favor. Muslims have to understand this, that they're not doing us a favor. Now, are we going to go to the opposite side of the spectrum and say, we really want to make sure that we're pushing people away from the masjid? I don't think any sane person involved in da'wah will say, my goal in da'wah is to continuously push people away from the masjid. But at the same time, we, we have to convey to the younger generation that there are certain ways to conduct yourself at the masjid. The same way, there's a certain way you conduct yourself when you go to the university. When you go to the uh, to the sports club, when you go working out, when you go to a party, when you, a halal party, of course, right? When you go to a marriage, that you don't mm. just go, for example, when you go to a marriage, a marriage ceremony, you don't go in your flops, you don't go in your shorts and say, "What's going on, guys?" Salam alaikum. No, there's a way of carrying yourself. There's a way to dress and. The, the, the middle path is for us to educate and to convey to the younger generation how things ought to be done. But this utter silence of, ooh, praise be to Allah, at least they're coming to the masjid. No, because now mm -hmm. it means that they have the leverage over us and they're going to dictate to us how we run the masjid when it sh should be the other way around. It's those with knowledge, mm. with age, with experience, who should dictate, of course, with the religious guidelines, how the masjid should navigate and operate. But this, oh, let's just thank mm. Allah they're coming to the masjid. No, we don't want to com completely mm. criticize them and push them away, but we also don't want to remain silent because guess what? This is going to affect them in other facets of life. If we make them feel like they're just always doing everybody a favor, this, gonna, this is going to hurt, hurt them at their job. It's going to hurt them in their personal relationships with their wives, with their husbands, with their family. So this is what I found out, Doctor. I tried to follow the du'at in America, and I tried to find, I really tried to give them the benefit of the doubt when they seek out this maslahayik approach. And every time I find a, a da'i, a sheikh, an imam, or a scholar taking this approach, I feel it's as though it's the person who's taken and trying to seek out a small benefit this big leaving behind him an evil that's created that's this big. I don't know if I could do that or not. So is it worth yeah. it at the end? Not at all. You do not create an evil that's 10 times the size of the benefit that you're trying to seek. Because in Islam, the, 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 the basic qaida is al-mafsada right? That the, the to ward off the evil takes precedence over gaining a good. Right? And th this takes a lot of time, but I find this 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 defeatist approach is, it, and, and again, it's not just at the masajid, it's in almost every facet of our Muslim environment, is that, no, we should just be quiet and thank Allah they came to the masjid, never talk about hijab because that sister might feel bad about coming, never tell the brothers that they have to come dressed appropriately because maybe they'll never come back to the masjid. I want to mention this and I'll, I'll give the mic to you. You know what's funny? Is that when a brother or sister is kicked out of the gym for doing something silly, do you know what they do? They figured out a way right there and then on how to come back the next day, whether it's from a different entrance, whether it's from a different exit, whether it's using a fake ID, whether it's going to a different one. They will, they've already devised a way on how to come back, right? The same thing with the mall. If you go into the mall and you're shopping, you get kicked out because of saying something silly, you got into a fight, you found a way on how to come back the following day, whether it's with the false ID, do you know why that is? But the, the Muslim will come after hearing a, a, a talk perhaps that didn't resonate with him well because he looked at it as being judgmental and criticism, and he'll say, I'm not coming back to the masjid anymore because of that khutbah yesterday that was so judgmental that put me off the wall. But do you know the difference here? Do you know why when it comes to the masjid, he's convinced himself that he's not going back because of the doing of someone else? Because shaitan doesn't want you to come back to the masjid. Shaitan wants you to go back shopping. He wants you to go to the club. He wants you to do this and that and the other. He doesn't care. That's why you found it a way, but you didn't blame anyone else. You took full responsibility when it came to the club, when it came to the bar, when it came to the, uh, the, 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 the gym. But when it comes to the masjid, it's easy to play the victim and blame your, what, what you're supposed to assume responsibility of and to blame it on someone else because Shaitan doesn't want you mm. to come back to the masjid. You see? Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, I believe, you know, subhanAllah, I think this is perfectly encapsulated in Surah Al-Hujarat, Ayah 17, where Allah SWT says that, you know, no, it's not, you're not conferring a favor uh, on Allah SWT, it's Allah that conferred the favor upon you with your Islam, you know. So your Allah Islam Allah. is not a Allah. favor to Allah, right? It's perfectly laid out. You're not doing anybody a favor. This is for our own benefit. You know, our, uh, this is, uh, I think people fail to get that core, you know, that core understanding. You know, when we're doing good things, sometimes the way that we reward, like even I would say religiously minded people, and maybe they're doing it innocently, they reward all good actions as if you're doing a favor. Oh, good thing. Here, here here's a reward. Not that uh, being good or that uh, who you should be necessitate certain actions. No, no, you're absolutely right. And, and, and you know, it, it's see, the young Muslim didn't just wake up one day and feel like they're doing someone a favor. This is the messages that they're getting from school. These are the messages they're getting in college. These are the message that they're getting from. I don't want to say this, but from a lot of our dua today, you're special, you're mm -hmm. special. You're doing it in this again, it hurts and it destroys. Why? Because now you develop this bubble and you feel as though you're off the limits. No one can criticize you because why? For years on end, you're being told that you're special. There's something really different and unique about you. So now when someone comes and tells you, uh, you're not really unique, that unique after all, right? They don't know how to take it. They're taken mm -hmm. back. Well, what do you mean? You know, and it becomes you're being judgmental. You're looking for their faults and you, you think you're better than everybody else. We're all sinners. I call these Muslim convenience cards, by the way, uh, all these uh, excuses right um so mm. may allah help us but we i think we have to change the, the dominant narrative we have to change it out of love and compassion for the younger generation because again this hurts them in every aspect of their future mm. yeah i think you make a very salient point about giving the full perspective and message you know many do sometimes as you've uh, mentioned they give this uh, narrow perspective or like, you know, you're the best nation, you're the best people, but you're forgetting the other part of it. <laughs> you know, you have to enjoy it and how to like you're supposed to, there's, there's like, uh, duties, there's obligations associated with it. There's, uh, certain core principles that are, that necessitate that, you know, so, uh, you're, um, you make a really salient point, Zama uh, Imam. All right, Imam. So, are there any effective, uh, given our current circumstances, given our current environment, what are some of the most effective programs or strategies have you seen to help uh, develop our youth? What are some of the most effective uh, programs that are are currently that we can utilize? People don't know about. Sure. Um, I feel like this really, this might not be the answer that people are looking for, but I feel the bulk of the responsibility truly is on both the parents and the du'at. Uh, the parents, obviously, because the first home is your, the home is the first school. And second is uh, the du'at. And what I mean by the du'at is anyone who is involved in preaching Islam, whether it's the khatib, whether it's the uh, imam, whether it's the celebrity speaker, whether it's the mufti, whether it's the you know the the, the scholar, the who, who what a road scholar, uh, you know who, whomever you want to call, um, I believe their responsibility is to try to balance things out. I mean, we're at <clears throat> one extreme of the pendulum. And what's happening, sadly, is that we're repeating a lot of these affirmations that are popular, uh, that are accepted, that are wide and prevalent. And what we're doing as Muslims is we're hanging on to that which is prevalent, right? And we're repeating it time and time again, time and time again. And this is why this is what uh, motivated me or kind of got me to write the six butts, if you will, focusing on one thing and not the other, focusing on one thing and not the other. And I think I'm up to, I think, six or seven now. But I think not having, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says, right? And to be just and do not allow one of the scales to be more than the other. And this is to be applicable, right, in any facet 
of, of in any aspect of our lives, right? whether it's in deen or whether in the khairul umuri awsatuha, the best of things are those that are in the middle. And Allah described this generation as ummatan wa kadalika ja'alnakum ummatan wa sata. And it is by that that it, we have made you into a. Um, and again, your question, by the way, I'm not going to do justice to it because I feel like it really needs a full lecture on its own as to how to, to, to cure or how to, to try to remedy, remedy this. But we have to acknowledge that we're doing bad by focusing on one aspect of things and completely neglecting or turning a blind eye on, on, on uh, the, the other side. No. Because, you know, when, we, when you're looking at, like, if, if there is a current uh, status quo that uh, you want to change, uh, one of the first things when you're trying to, like, for example, turn around the company, say there's a company, you're trying to turn around a company, is the, one of the easiest things to do, what is the existing infrastructure or resources that are in place that can be utilized more properly, you know? And, um, and, and within our community, it's like, you know, we have Islamic schools, we have masajid, uh, you know, we have du'at, we have, we have certain things that I believe, uh, and from some, uh, my impression that I'm getting from you, that we can actually utilize more effectively. You know, we, we don't need necessarily like a huge, um, it's not limited to an external factor that doesn't exist yet or that we have to create. There is a lot of existing infrastructure that we can utilize to help change the trajectory of where our Muslim communities are, are headed. And one of the things that I felt that's been really underutilized, really underutilized, is the process of learning is really disconnected between uh, the children and the parents. So it's almost like, you know, everyone's compartmentalized. So the children, Oh, maybe they're exposed to Islamic school or they're going, you know, some youth programs, things like that. And then the parents have nothing to do with that or they'll go to a conference, an Islamic conference, and they're not going to be necessarily with their parents. There's no discussion. You're sitting in the Juma khutbahs. Uh, you may not be sitting with your parents or there's no discussion of the khutbah afterwards, right? So it's really compartmentalized where you look at the Sahaba, عن, we have examples of the children, like for example, uh, the son of Amr bin al-Khattab, radiallahu an, Abdullah bin Amr, they're sitting together, listening to the halaqa, the reminder of uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then afterwards there's a discussion happening. You know, I knew the uh, Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu an said, I knew the answer to this. Like, why didn't you answer the question? You see this beautiful mm -hmm. interplay between mm -hmm. the father and the son. I think that's a, like a sweet. Um, interaction and a sweet process that we are devoiding ourselves with like learning together because many of the messages that you say uh like for example youtube like you see a whole bunch of youth watching youtube maybe if the parents aren't watching it then there's going to be this disconnect there's going to be this and, and we need to have that the more you can establish that the more stable ecosystem you can establish in the household what are, what are your comments on on that imam i'm a big believer in like the parents and children learning Islam together. Yeah, without a doubt, and, and I don't think that requires a genius. Um, not to not to discount what you said but, by any means, yeah. but I this is what I think any parent who really wants to see good uh, uh, in their children in in, in terms in the longevity and in, in the future uh, in the long run, there has to be. I, I mean, I have kids myself. Whether it's taking them to the masjid, whether it's reminding them of their Quran, whether it's bringing up subjects that they want to bring about, whether it's reminding them of being grateful of of, of everything they have and to look at the, the the world beyond you know the radius of the two blocks that they live in and so on and so forth. So, like you said, it, it's not going to cut it to be completely absent as a parent and then to come on the weekend national conference where unfortunately sometimes it's more of a of an entertainment gathering where it's nasheed i say allah you scream akbar and i mean I, unfortunately that's really <laughs> not it's more of just entertainment yeah. and again not to be cynical yeah. but this is our sad reality it's it's you're not just going to mm. come out of nowhere once a year or twice a year and say you know what Alhamdulillah, we're, we're religiously inclined, you know, we're, we're very conscious of our religion and we want to make sure that we're, you know, uh, uh, doing our part. So we're going to go to this conference once a year. When in re I mean, you look at what these things have become, it I, I can't really say that 
you're going to go there and learn much. But going back, not to drift too far away, I think the parents, the parents and the children, there has to be that tight connection. What I see oftentimes happen, doctor, is that parents are living, immigrant parents, they're living in America, but their hearts are back home. This is a huge problem, meaning that they know every aspect of the political life back home, who's the new prime minister, who was recently assassinated, who's who got recently elected, and the list goes on and on. They know everything about what's back. Their heart is still back home, although they're living here and they never go back home, but they're completely oblivious. Let me say this. They know more about what's going on back home than they do know about what is actually going on in their own children's telephone, their their, mm. their, uh, their cell phones or their uh, smartphones. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's what creates the disconnect. You know, they're not they're not engaged enough. And of course, this comes with with grave consequences. Is there uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, the 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 U.S. Muslim community at large, where do you think uh, the greatest uh, barrier lies, you know, to, to, you know, to move forward with, you know, some of these ad advices that you've given us? Like, what do you think is the biggest barrier that's, that's, that's holding us back? I know you said in, in terms of like uh, previously that, that attitude of, um, you know, we're, uh, uh, you know, we're do like, it's like a favor that, uh, you know, people are doing to us by just coming to the masjid as as like an attitude in terms of like you know one of the greatest barriers but what do you think right now do you think it's the fact that the uh quote unquote um uh, western liberal ideology is now becoming like inculcated within uh, our, our community and our mindset do you think that's the biggest thing or do you think it's just a lack of knowledge like we just don't have enough knowledge and basis to counteract that what do you think is the biggest barrier to allow us to progress well doctor i don't know if i'm gonna say this in chronological order in terms of what's more dangerous and what's the least dangerous but I, uh, I think it's a few mm. it's a few factors. It's again going back to the self inferiority complex. Um, we have to start believing that you being a Muslim is the greatest gift. I know I know it, it's not that's not the way it's portrayed out in mainstream society where you're a Muslim. There's nothing special about you. People don't start giving you a round of applause and say no way. <gasps> It's not fun. It's not, it's really, it's not popular to say that you're a Muslim, let alone to say that you're a practicing Muslim, because now you're a fundamentalist and you're supporting all these crazy groups out there and so on and so forth. In terms of knowledge, so we have to find it within our hearts. This is of Amal al qulub is for me to have that humility and humbleness and to submit with my hurt my heart, first and foremost, to say, I'm humbled to see how many people misguided and misled, and they're in a whole world of their own that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose me to worship him and to submit to him. That's the, the, the biggest gift. Number two, in terms of knowledge, I think there's a lot of knowledge out there. The one issue is we have become people who want to be entertained, meaning that for me to sit through an hour lecture or a two hour lecture where you're really going to learn the basic fundamentals of your Islam, what's halal, what's haram, what's permissible and what's not, what's ideal and what's not, what and for, for the younger generation, it's somewhat difficult. You have to always, you have to cater, you have to bring the pop, you have to bring the pizza, you have to, so it's, it's gonna be more entertaining, more than it is rigorous, but for whatever reason, when it comes to the college, they're willing to compromise the friends, they're willing to compromise the phone, they're willing to compromise the time spent on social media and on and on. But when it comes to the religion, see, and again, that goes back to just how much we value this Dean versus how much we don't. So the knowledge is out there. The knowledge is out there. What I feel is not helpful is when we get these affirmations time and time and time again by popular social media, even the Muslim pages, because all they're confronted with, and I'm critical, I'm very, very critical of the way the Dao is taking place across the globe. All the average Muslim on, on it one day, they, they, they have so many pages that they've liked. And the majority of the time, right, it's things that they're seeing in the public page or this day, this mainstream day, what they're oftentimes doing is, 
You're doing a great job. No, you're, you're good as you are. Don't let nobody judge you. Don't let nobody criticize you. If you Now, at the surface level, level, you can't say that this post in itself, independently, there's a problem with it. The, the issue, the issue lies in it becoming so repetitive that this is all you're used to and this is all you're looking forward to. That, as I mentioned earlier, that now when you see something that contradicts that, it jumps at you as being judgmental, you're taken back and you're, it doesn't sit well with you. Too much of that, I feel, is ruining us. Now, mm. You know, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end time, so I, I want to actually uh, switch gears to talk about something else. It's also trending uh, quite a bit lately, and it came to a shock uh, to a lot of people. I know, but I wanted to get your impression in regards to this because there is a lot of talk. Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What are the ramifications of it? Uh, and, and because it is uh, a, uh, a a recent topic that's trending within our community, I wanted to get your insight on it. Are you aware of how they have recently changed the system for Hajj in terms of selection from Western countries? Yes. I'm not. I'm not familiar with okay. the details. I know many du'ad have written extensive, extensively. It has to be done through a certain portal, and then it's it's the women who yeah. can. Um, and I'm probably blameworthy for this. We're not necessarily focusing on it, but um, may, you, mm. this is kind of what I got from it. Is that right? Is that you can women can go on their own, and it could be done through a portal, eliminating them. Is that? I think the yeah that I, I that could perhaps be uh, an aspect of it, but what it seems like. You know, before it would be certain groups uh, that were given permission, like certain companies, like travel agencies, that were given permission to organize Hajj for people. So they would oftentimes have like an imam or a, a da'i or person of knowledge that would help guide this particular group. They would apply for the visas, you know, and it was basically your local, uh, most likely it would be in your city or a company that operates within your country that you would apply through they would organize these groups and they would you know take care of the whole travel the the flights the hotel right. and then also the right. different rites and rituals of the hajj now it's become from what i understand all of those uh, packages that were booked are now canceled so they're all canceled so people who were uh, my own brother was going to go for you know hajj and he okay. was going to be mahram uh for somebody and uh and so then that's canceled. Like everything's can uh, everything's canceled, and um, now it's as you mentioned, it's an individual portal, and I think it might be a lottery system too. So on the surface, uh, for some people, it looks a little bit cheaper, although they have to book their own flights. So let me maybe perhaps the hotel and whatever the cost of visa and things like that are included through the through the portal, perhaps. But uh, you know they may have to still book their flights, but now you're just going out on your own. So then now maybe you have to personally organize yourself when you get there because not everybody is, even if they take, uh, for example, a, uh, a like a crash course on how to get, do Hajj, you know, when you get there, other questions might arise. You might not know, like, uh, you know, you can't make a fatwa for yourself at that moment. You don't have the background. And uh, Allahu Alam, if you have the support that you need, because you know a lot of times when you go in these groups, you know you have elderly people, and they usually like you know, people within the group or the head of the group yes. will support different members within the group. Yes. So uh, on one hand, people are saying it, perhaps it's a good thing because uh, the price, at least for now, I don't know if it's going to be a bait and switch in the future, but the price for now is looks like it could be cheaper because these prices for these packages were going up and up and up. But then, as you know, in terms of like perhaps a lot of the support or the local support or the familiarity you might have, you might be going with your local iman, which you have known for years, you know, you're going for hajj with them. Right. That is now, uh, you know, may, may not, is no longer available. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, I don't know if this portal system takes into account, like what if the husband and wife want to go together, the wife gets accepted, the husband doesn't get accepted because it's a lottery system, right? Um, so... It, it, it just seems a lot of chaos right now and, and, and people are really confused Some people are really upset because they've been, uh, you know, planning this for years. They booked their package and now it's just canceled as for some people they're like, oh, this is good. Now I, it's affordable. I can just go. I don't have to go through this company. I can just apply in this portal. I can go. So what, what are your thoughts? Because this is a big trend. Like everybody's talking about this and everyone's different opinions and 
um, there's a lot of confusion, especially at this moment. Well, يعني, again, يعني, I, I might, يعني, I might be blameworthy of not being on top of it. it it's hard staying on. You, you focus on one thing and you find yourself, you know, neglecting yeah. the other. Um, but going back to that, it's not as easy as people wanted to see. Uh, again, as you mentioned earlier, I think you've covered it uh, pretty succinctly, and that is that it's not easy going to Hajj. I mean, you have to literally understand, يعني, باب الحج ثق. And jurisprudentially, you have to understand يعني, the, 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 the arcan of the Hajj, the Sunan, the Wajibat, uh, the Aramil Jamarat, uh, يعني, you have to understand these things. And going by yourself is quite problematic, right? And another thing, too, is as you said earlier, well, the ticket might be a little bit cheaper, perhaps, but then what is going on on the other side? Is that because I, I don't know the details of it? Are there going to be people? waiting on the other side? Are there groups that are going to be formed on the other side? Is the government going to do that? Do we have certain procs? What is exactly going on on the other side? Because as you mentioned earlier, uh, to go on your own, you're you're literally throwing yourself in the middle of, of nowhere. You don't know what is going on, what is not. And like you said, having that support group of going with your imam, with going with your scholar, people you know, uh, people that you trust and so on and so forth is very, very uh, different. Uh, then, then just, and, and, and I'm not sure, Allahu Alam, I didn't do enough digging to say, to know why, why suddenly the change. Um, so I, I think, mm -hmm. I think we're going to wait as things unfold to see what's really, where are the pros really, and where are the cons. And, and I think that'll be a healthy way of, of approaching it to see what unfolds later. Uh, given what we know, obviously, we both have limited knowledge uh, to the details. And I think even generally speaking, a lot of people are confused. They don't understand how this is truly going to unfold. Imagine you have one a, a person who gets accepted. They're going on their own for Hajj. What are some advices that you can give to them? Wow. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, as, as, as crazy as that meaning, I don't know. Because I don't know what's what all this this whole new procedure. I don't know what it what it entails exactly. Again, what's going on on the other side? Are you? Are, is there someone that's going to meet you there? Is there a group when you get there, is, or is it just on your own? Do you have your hotel? Is there a leader? Uh, you know, I I, I, I will lie. I don't know. It's I I don't want to say people shouldn't go, yeah. but I think. And again, I don't want to say that those who are going are, you know, it's as if they're guinea pigs being tested. Ma'adullah, that's not what I'm going to say. But I feel like mm. anything in its early stages is always up. It's a matter of trial and error, right? Uh, so maybe perhaps mm. this might be tried this year and completely canceled the following year. Allahu alam. So that's why it's, it's mm. if you're going to go, you're really going to have to accept that there are a lot of things that you're going to have to go and in, in, in risk and in, in be okay with mm -hmm. it, right? Not knowing what the consequences are or, or what, what's awaiting you on the other end. Hmm. In terms of, say, just then, a general nasiha of preparing for hajj, what would you say for, for anybody, whether this oh. situation or anything else? Wallahi, it's, it, it, I mean, first, is to, first, I mean, obviously, is to understand يعني, the intention between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know that you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, irrespective of what happens between your trip, the inconveniences, the, the downfalls, and so on and so forth, is that you're going because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained hajj on you. It's the pillar, one of the main pillars of Islam, and that you're fulfilling a duty for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to put through it. You're going to have to, uh, basically, it's a mental state that you have to literally put yourself in, and you have to, I don't want to say welcome it, but you're going to have to accept it for that time being that you're there, and especially with this, the new, the new formula or the new procedure that is being laid out, that's going to require a little bit more patience, forbearance, and 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 you know, accepting the fact that it's it's not the way that it's it's been done before. Mm. Are there common yeah. mistakes you see from people in terms of their approach for Hajj or uh, at Hajj uh, itself that people should avoid? Well, the one thing that I at least hear about often is people being hasty 
right? Still being in that negative attitude, not realizing that they're in the haram, they're in the sacred land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, not preparing themselves mentally. They're still arguing as if they're at the, someone bumped them and, you know, that guy is so rude or this person did that. I mean, you're going to have to really, uh, especially living in America, you get used to a certain pattern, a certain lifestyle where it's the courtesy. It's not like back home. You're you're going one way and the other person is going the one way. He's going against you. He's at fault, but he's looking at you. You know, hey, what are you doing? You know, like, well, hey, you're at fault, not me, right? <laughs> you're the one to blame, not me. Mm. So a lot of this chaos, people have to really mentally, psychologically prepare themselves for a lot of the chaos, a lot of the, 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 the rude and uncouth behavior that one is going to find uh, at Hajj. And it might not necessarily be intentional. It's just, it's the nature of Hajj where people are crammed. It's it's not, you know, it's not, it, 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 it's different. It's a, it's a whole different experience and a whole different environment that people ought to mentally prepare themselves for. Uh, Mm. And for us who aren't going for Hajj, uh, you know, the days of Dhul Hijjah uh, are approaching. What are some advices you can give us uh, in terms of utilizing those days for us being left behind? Yeah. Um, well, like, what, one thing that I, I try to do is is to minimize um, minimize your exposure or your time on, on social media. Um, subhanallah, I, I was talking with my brother just last night and I said, subhanallah, I remember the days when I wasn't on social media at all versus the days where I'm on social media. I mean, we don't realize how much time that takes away from us. You're checking a message, you're sending a link, you're reading this article. At the end of the day, if you were to really add the 30 minutes here, the 10 minutes here, the two minutes there, it's probably going to add up to maybe an hour, hour and a half. Now, imagine what you could have done with that time spent online. Now, I know we like to convince ourselves that, no, no, it's beneficial, it's for da'wah, it's for the sake of Allah, and I, I think we all do this, right? But at the same time, there are certain times, like for example, in Ramadan, I try to stay off social media completely because I know when you're leaving a post, you're writing a post, you're, there are replies that you're gonna wanna do, there are comments you're gonna wanna leave, there are replies that you have to get to, and it's a lot of things going on. So. One thing I think we should try to do during these blessed times, right, these, these seasonal times, is to minimize our usage of, of, of uh, social media and minimize our time of uh, being on social media, irrespective of the application or the site. These days are ayam dhikr. They are days to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one should make it a habit uh, subhanAllah, make it a habit of always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you're driving, whether you're working, whether you're, yeah, and you try to get your, 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 your nafs and your body used to, you know, SubhanAllah, 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 it's very easy, you start, and I think all of us can relate to this, is you start with dhikr, and then you find yourself thinking about a trip or you find yourself thinking about you know something or something that you have to get done and that's shaitan trying to get you carried away you know and remove you from remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's one thing to consider is that these are definitely a yam of dhikr and praise of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um and it doesn't have to be a specific time you don't have to set yourself in a corner and look at the qibla you make sure you're doing dhikr constantly throughout the day. You know, you're walking, subhanAllah, bihamdi, subhanAllah, alayhi, subhan, you're taking a walk in the park. Whatever it is you're doing, make it a habit. Get yourself in the habit of always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and re just remembering, you know, sending salutations upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa especially in these in these seasonal times, meaning, you know, the, the, the 10 days of the day. Hmm. And uh, I had, uh, it might be, uh, again, a, a little bit of a, obscure type of question that you may not have thought about so if you don't have any comments it's fine but uh what are your thoughts you know how when we uh like when it comes to, for example especially the month of ramadan in terms of uh the moon sighting and how we uh determine the beginning of ramadan the end of ramadan uh, there's not a you know obviously there's not a uniformity across the muslim world um in regards to like the day that they start and the day at the end Okay, so we, we we understand that, and we know that there are you know different rulings in terms of uh, citing the moon locally or you know just going by calculation. However, uh, it, it kind of throws you off sync when it comes to the time of 
Hajj, right? Because now uh, you're following along with the Hajjaj, you know, like, so what are your, what is your opinion on that? Because uh, to me that it's like, okay, you follow the, the local, which might be out of sync from Saudi when they, uh, you know, when they announce it, but then you have to almost, you know, if you want to sync with what's happening in Hajj in those first 10 days of Dhul Hajj and everything, you almost uh, are compelled to line up with, uh, with them. Uh, do you think it's just more consistent that we just all follow, follow Saudi or from like a logistical perspective? Uh, because, uh, you know, say you, you follow a different timeline for Ramadan, but then if you want to line up with the days of the Hajjah, then you have to almost like manipulate, perhaps you might have to, uh, you know, change the, the dates or manipulate the criteria during that time so it's almost like you end up following saudi anyways but you're just you know doing a different form of on so that's i was thinking just more from a not from like uh, a perspective of like whether it's like permissible or not but more of like logistical reasoning for that sure in yeah. these case in these cases well i do right is to to do to do mm. your best to bring closure uh not to be difficult and yani, as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is to fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to one's uh, best uh, ability and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that these exceptions or these oddities will remain exceptions and they're not the everyday norm now okay. Jazamah khair, Imam Yusuf. We really benefited from your time and your contribution. I know you have to get going, and uh, we really appreciate the time that you did carve out for us uh, today uh, with your schedule. So, Jazamah khair, and we hope to have you back on the program again very soon. I mean, I mean, Jazakumullah khair again for for bringing me on. It was uh, it was it was a very good discussion. Allahumma barik. Uh, and I ask Allah again, as I said earlier at the very beginning, that Allah rewards you uh, all for your time and for your efforts. And um, keep me in your du'a, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Hayakumullah. I mean, and to our audience, remember as always, we live by the haq, we die by the haq, and just when you think life is stuck, tune in to life haq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.